I'm elated, honestly, to introduce tonight's stars who I haven't seen in a long time. Um, uh, here to discuss the book with Alyssa is Tracy Clark Flory. Uh, she is a journalist who writes about feminism, gender, motherhood, pop culture, sex, technology, and more. Um, she's the author of the incredible memoir, Want Me, A Sex Writer's Journey into the Heart of Desire, which just came out with Penguin. Yes, make some noise. <laughs> we got some copies um, at the register. She is repping it there right now. Um, and the star of the evening is Alyssa Bassist. Alyssa is an essayist, humor writer, and editor of the Funny Women column on The Rumpus. As a founding contributor to The Rumpus, she's written cultural, feminist, and personal criticism since the website launched in 2009, also the year that I became a fan of Alyssa. Um, <laughs> she teaches writing at the New, the New York School Catapult, 92nd Street Y, and Lighthouse Writers Workshop. She lives in Brooklyn and is probably her therapist's favorite. I'm um, so excited that our paths have crossed again here um, in the hallowed halls of Yule Booksmith, as happens so often. Um, if y'all also are pleased to be here to celebrate Alyssa, please um, make some noise to welcome Alyssa Bassist. <laughs> Tracy Carpenter. On my way here, the Lyft driver asked me if I was on my way to a Halloween costume party. <laughs> <laughs> My Lyft driver did not <laughs> ask that question. <laughs> What's happening with my lipstick? Your lipstick is good, <laughs> and it is not on your teeth at Great. all. You're good. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Evan. My like headshot for a really long time and my teaching photo is of me at Literary Deathmatch, and you're in the photo looking up at me like so in awe. It's the... <laughs> It's very gorgeous, and it always makes me feel really good to see that photo and um, when you're not cropped out of it. <laughs> Thank you for that look. It's sustained me for years. <laughs> hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, friends from middle school, childhood, birth. We have the same birthday. <laughs> my students, strangers. Um, for those who don't know what my book is about and how dare you, um, it's about how a woman's voice develops or doesn't in a world where men talk and women are supposed to shut up. And it's about how that expectation of a woman's silence made me very, very sick. It's a very, very good book. I highly recommend it. Um, tonight I'm reading from chapter three called Crazy Psycho Bitches. My ex-boyfriend wrote the chapter title and he wanted the credit. Not to be dramatic, but after all of my breakups, I've been prescribed antidepressants. Every time some guy left and took with him all meaning, a doctor said there's a pill for that. Antidepressants are the new lobotomy for women dealing with trauma, writes Caroline Serrato Perez in her cookbook, Invisible Women, Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. It's not a cookbook, that's a hilarious joke. <laughs> it's new and age old. America has a history of prescribing pills to traumatized, anxious, depressed, too emotional, and loudmouth women. Am I right, ladies? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when my very first therapist out of thousands asked in my inaugural therapy session at age 20, so, what brings you here today? I didn't know where to start. Didn't know just how many reasons there were, or that there were so many reasons. I thought about which reason to say first. A system of society and government in which men hold the power and women don't, and also the internet, I wish I'd said. But here's the truth. Days earlier, www.thefacebook.com, as it was known, informed me via library ethernet that the love of my life was in a relationship with someone who wasn't me. Oh. I know. <laughs> and so I signed out of myself and did what really forlorn actors do in movies. I found a nearby wall and I slowly slid down it <laughs> with my head in my hand and my face arranged in despair as I projectile sobbed over the Shakespearean betrayal. Here was my torch, but pictured there was his new girlfriend. I'd hung on his line, so to speak, until it was Facebook that said we were never ever getting back together. I invented that line before Taylor Swift was born. 
Classmates watched me or didn't see me, texting about Michelangelo as I hugged my knees to my abdomen and rocked back and forth on the floor until the library announced that it was closing. Life was, by slight of heartbreak, dog shit. I managed to function, sort of, like I could walk if I felt like it, but I didn't feel like it. This is just being a person I had romanticized. A woman, a hungry woman. But no one called me a hungry woman. She's a crazy psycho bitch, I'd overheard one classmate say. Back at the dorms, I saw posters for a place called Mental Health Services, and I could have kissed each poster. I needed help. But for what? For this? For crying a lot? Over a boy? For acting my age and genus, 20 and human? For wanting and for needing at the same time? because I felt crazy for feeling how I felt. But the reason I told the therapist was love. I'm in love, I said by screaming it. Unreciprocated, I added, and didn't stop for the full session. Oh, to talk. And the other person, an employee, had to listen and had to help and had to fix everything. Is there anything else you want to talk about? She asked me months later. You talk about boys an absurd amount. Rude. (laughs) It was true that I consistently failed my own Bechtel test. But I was raised to talk and to think about boys above all, to have boys be my response to how are you. More than is normal, I asked her. I was thinking of the medical history form I'd filled out to see her that had me circle my title, Miss or Mrs. or Ms. is not married or is married or was married. My relationship status was my identity. What is normal anyway, she asked. And then she diagnosed me with major depressive disorder. It's funny. (laughs) If I'd lived in other centuries, the Greeks would diagnose me with having a uterus, which was the origin of all disease, according to them. And they would say it caused me to behave erratically that is, to have emotional outbursts. The Egyptians, who were the first to use the term hysteria, would use the term on me to explain my behavioral disruptions, that is, my emotional outbursts. Medievalists would label me diseased since I didn't conform to to traditional quiet femininity, that is, I had emotional outbursts. Renaissance men would call me a witch and they would be right. During the 19th century, I'd be certifiable and incarcerated. In the late 19th century, Freud would deal with me like the university therapist by treating me using my own voice. But he'd also hypnotize me into an emotional outburst and get me to admit to some repressed weird sex stuff, of which I had a lot. (laughs) A few years ago, Republicans would call me hysterical for fretting about reproductive rights. You're being hysterical, people have told women for years, decades, centuries, for fearing for our rights and for our safety and for fearing correctly. Applause. (laughs) (laughs) Today, my ex-boyfriends would and did diagnose me as a crazy psycho bitch, meaning a woman scorned or unloved who is obsessed and overzealous and needy and stubborn and appears in American thrillers and horror movies and in every single heterosexual relationship. She's beautiful but psycho, sweet but psycho, driven by trauma but psycho. (laughs) By the way, men cannot be crazy psycho bitches. The horror thriller dramedy American Psycho is about a legit psychotic man, Patrick Bateman, But real-life men revere him because as a psycho, he can be as violent and disgusting to women as some real-life men wish they could be. But not all men. (laughs) I couldn't help but wonder in college, did I have a chemical imbalance and were my emotions diseased? Or was I just a thinking, feeling, speaking woman? Could it be both? It could. A woman can have it all. Historically, expression has been called illness in women. Expressive women were mad women, whether or not they were mad, and they were drugged all the same. 
Today, the label crazy psycho bitch collapses the distinction between vocal, emotional, dependent, irrational, neurotic, imbalanced, insane, hysterical, melodramatic, hormonal, oversensitive, unwell, unstable, fragile, irritating, infuriating, manipulative, vindictive, mendacious, and clinical until vocal itself is a symptom, until every single ex-girlfriend is a crazy psycho bitch. I broke up with her because she's crazy has justified millions of breakups, including mine. Anyone else ever get that one? <laughs> yeah, everyone. It's a national statistic, 100% of people. How can it be that so many people's ex-girlfriends are crazy? The rumpus advice columnist Sugar asked in response to a man's anonymous letter about dating a self-absorbed crazy girl. There is no actual national statistic on crazy ex-girlfriends, but it seems that so many of us are crazy because it doesn't take much to be too much. I've been called crazy for wanting to communicate, for articulating my emotions through crying or yelling a few times in public, so what? <laughs> for texting multiple times in a row without a response and for actually texting a little bit more than that. Too many times I put myself out there and said what I meant and have heard that's psychotic. Literally, any conversation can become a diagnosis. At my last reading, a man came up to me and asked me if I was autistic. I was like, whoa. <laughs> I know, I must sound nuts. Because the label works. Being called a crazy psycho bitch or any variant kept me quiet while keeping me crazy. It also kept me in pain, which kept me powerless. Among the first conversations I stopped having were those in which I could be considered crazy or psycho or a bitch. It was just so much easier to suppress my moods and my sorrows and my entire personality. Easier to yell less and ask for less and settle for less and be less. To censor my wanting and to want less. And I also tried to suffer less, either invisibly or with a smile, so as to not provoke or inconvenience or frustrate anyone at all, ever. Thank you, and I will now shut up. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Yay, thank you. <laughs> so, Alyssa and I met over a decade ago at another um, literary event in San Francisco called Literary Deathmatch. Alyssa was a judge, and I was reading a personal essay about masturbating to my dad's porn. <laughs> and I was like, she wins. I don't need to hear anything else. <laughs> I, did, I did win, yes. <laughs> she did. <laughs> but this also apparently made Alyssa think that I would make an excellent roommate because she asked me to move in with her after that. And I did, and we became very close friends. <laughs> And I bring that up because, <laughs> as a result of that, I was able to witness the genesis of this book over a decade ago, and I thought we could begin by reenacting some of our earliest conversations about this book, um, many of which transpired over Gchat, which is the primary medium of our friendship. <laughs> because I moved to New York, not because we're weird. Mm. <laughs> Questionable. Um, so, Alyssa, I'm going to have you read your parts, and I'm going to read my parts. I can't wait to hear okay. about how inspired I was all the time <laughs> and how excited I was to write. The confidence just right my out the gate. My confidence, you guys mm -hmm. are going to be blown away by how confident I was. It's pretty good. So we're going <laughs> to we're gonna start in 2010. I think I figured out my book idea. What is it? The title is perfect. The Power of Negative Thinking. <laughs> I pitched that to my agent at the time, and she was like, no, <laughs> hard no. <laughs> Next chat. There are not enough hours in the day to write my own book. Help me. Tell me about it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I need to write my book, but I'm very afraid. It won't happen overnight. Patience, friend. <laughs> Cut to literally 12 years later. <laughs> Next chat. The reason I like women teachers is because I really want a lady writer mentor who identifies and likes my book. I'm not being sexist. <laughs> Reverse sexism doesn't exist. Doesn't count. <laughs> oh, now it's 2011, and I am. I'm working on book chapter two. I've made it so far, and it's emotionally insane. It's the one about the rape stuff. 
I don't know why I put that in quotes. <laughs> and I just wanted to say hello to my friend. Now, now that I write every day, I've gone nuts on writing. I wish I could write books forever. Please quote me on that and remind me that I said it. This is me quoting you on that. <laughs> Reminding you. Oh, this one's really this, good. So this is April 1st, 2011. Random House just bought my book. Um, expand. I didn't even know your agent was shopping it yet. Oh, it's double-sided. Yeah, isn't it crazy? She was shopping the first finished copies, and I didn't think anything would come of it. You're going to love the title. It's April Fool's. Fuck you. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I literally go. (laughs) 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 And then I say, I called my dad and told him I was pregnant. I love today. (laughs) Next chat, undated. My book is dead in the water. It is bad and it, it is bad and will it never ever be done? What is my motivation? It goes nowhere. You haven't finished it yet. There's no reason to really. I just don't see the point. Oh Jesus, Alyssa, that refrain is getting really tired. Wow, really supportive. <laughs> who cares about my life? Why do I think it's important enough to write about? And who will pay for it? No one. I need to find a real job. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who bought my <laughs> book about my life. <laughs> <laughs> next chat this book is dumb and what the fuck am i doing with my life okay so you're having a fit of self-defeating doubt tell it to shut its stupid fucking mouth <laughs> i'm just supposed to keep working even though it's bad and painful you just have to do yourself a favor and finish just finish okay just finish yes that's all forget the other shit just finish this fucking book you're so close <laughs> this was in 2012 yeah. <laughs> it published last month. I was not so fucking close. <laughs> okay. Now it's 2012. Tracy, I'm about to have a panic attack about this life without my book to write. How about instead you start writing? <laughs> <laughs> but what the fuck do I do? There's no reason to live. It's not like the book is over, over. You still have revisions to do, yeah? This is like the sh- slow reintroduction to normal society. <laughs> You get to start writing other things, then return to the book, then write other things, etc. I think my book had just been re- rejected by like the 70th agent. Um, okay, but I don't know what else to write. I just put my whole everything into that book. Maybe you don't write. Maybe you read or do <laughs> yoga or take a break. Maybe a vacation to San Francisco. Arg. You always ignore my best advice. <laughs> The more I try to write something else, the more I come back to my book because it's the really true thing I love so much that doesn't make me want to vomit from being a failure. I love this book. I never want to stop writing it. Next chat. I want to talk more, but I really must get back to writing my book. One month deadline. (laughs) I want to vomit. I want to have sex with someone and then vomit. (laughs) Next Next chat. Oh my God, my book sucks. It is so fucking bad. (laughs) <laughs> this is what we did for, for uh, years. one decade. But, so now <laughs> we'll spare you the rest and we'll fast forward to 2020. Okay. And I say, you there? Yes, hi. I'm just watching Angel and crying. Cool, cool. <laughs> 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 so you texted. You have a new book title? What is it? Are you ready for perfection? It is as perfect as want me. It's at that level. It is. Hysterical by Elizabeth Sist. I love it. Yep, that's it. <laughs> that is, that is it. <laughs> that was it. What an incredible play. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, first question for you. As you know, while you were writing this book, uh, you essentially cured my chronic pain that I was dealing with. True story. I'm not just saying this. Um, that's you read the proposal yes. and then you were cured of pain I was and then cured. we were like oh, from, shit, from the we, mere proposal yeah and I was all. like we did it this time yes it's, this proposal is gonna sell yes yeah um, and so you cured that pain with this idea that pain can originate from unexpressed emotion I have of late had a return of that pain not my fault um, <laughs> and I'm wondering selfishly can you remind me and our audience how one expresses emotion (laughs) any hot tips (laughs) yeah so once I finished writing this book I felt I felt cured but then it's like everything I learned I forget 
upon waking every day and I have to like relearn all the lessons that I wrote so so authoritatively about and it's just it's like this this is what you should do okay you feel something let yourself feel it don't push it down Mm -hmm. don't do that do the opposite of that let it come out just go to town I've been watching a reality show called Bachelor in Paradise and so all the women, you know, they always go off the rails and everyone's like, oh, shit, it's about to be like Tornado Shanae. And um, just because she, her feelings are hurt and, sh- and she got rejected and she has big emotions. And I'm just like, Ugh. just like normalize having a big reaction to an upsetting event. And like, why do we demonize and make it and pathologize something that's it's just so normal to feel these feelings and now I like love it when these women erupt I feel like they're actually causing like a revolution um because they're they're letting themselves embody just like every feeling and they're just feeling it all like one through a hundred all the feelings at one time in front of a fucking camera in front of all these people who are hating on them and judging them and I just think they're the new role models <laughs> for feeling feelings. I just am like, I, I want to do that. For so long, I pushed down every feeling I had, and it would like always bubble up like in a very random panic attack, in very random pain. And I'm like, if I just let myself be mad when I felt mad and let myself like ha- like dissolve when I needed to dissolve it as opposed to like just like trying to keep it together – in a way as self-protection and as a way to like protect other people from me. If I just don't do that, I'm just so, I feel so much better. So whatever you're like, what are you feeling right now? <laughs> Let's sh- show us. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, no pressure. <laughs> but it's so hard to get back to like feel your feelings. Cause I feel like I well, used to feel deeply. Yeah. And then I, mo- yeah, when you asked that, I was like, I, I don't know what I'm feeling right now. Yeah, I actually really do not know. Yeah, I used to feel then that was like really not cute. So then I stopped or I tried to stop. And then my therapist, one of them along the way, she was like, how are you feeling? And I was like, well, I think I feel she was like, no, stop. Like, what do you feel? And w- our work together was getting to figure out what the fuck it was that I felt because I had turned it off. Right. And beyond qualifying it. Like, I, th- I think like it's it's like, no, I this is what I'm feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just it, there are so many like scary emotions. Like it feels like scary to feel sad or enraged. And it's like we're only allowed like two feelings of like joy and like cooking someone a sandwich. Um, and so we have to figure out just like what everything else feels like and and like when it comes to just like follow it as as opposed to squash it yeah Uh, but I think it's a long journey (coughs) yeah and sometimes we need like I feel like with your proposal gave me like the first dose of medicine that I needed and now this is my like second (laughs) dose thank you for that thank you Um, so you dedicate your book to your mom and every other crazy psycho bitch. (laughs) In other words, every other woman who has been dismissed as crazy or psycho or bitchy for being a woman with a voice and or feelings per that definition. What's the most psycho thing you've ever done? Oh, definitely write this book. I mean, I said everything I wasn't supposed to say and told every secret I have, um, which is a totally valid art form. (laughs) Uh, Like everything that I had been afraid to say and that I thought people would sue me over or um, unlove me or um, end end our relationship. Like I felt like I put all that on the line. But, But that fear was part of what took me so long to write the book, which was 11 years only. Thank you. Um, Because I was just like, I I put all of their potential annoyance at me or um, I just put all of their feelings and concerns and what they would think of me ahead of what I needed to say. And in the whole time I was writing it, I was like, this is crazy. I am crazy. People are going to think I'm crazy. 
Um, I look insane. They're going to call me insane. This is like going to ruin my life. But it was the most liberating experience. And I feel like so much of that noise is just patri patriarchal bullshit. And it's like we subscribe to the patriarchal live stream that says like whatever we're thinking, feeling or saying or accusing or criticizing is like lethal to other people and they will like take swift revenge upon us and it just so often isn't the case I mean I went to OCD therapy thank you and um <laughs> learned a lot about fear and how out of whack women's fear systems are and marginalized communities fear systems because you're just afraid anything you say or do could get you killed and and it's not an unfounded fear like the statistics back it up what was the question I got <laughs> that was the craziest thing you've ever, or most psycho thing you've ever done. Yeah, it's a write and publish this book. <laughs> I'm waiting for all the hate. So far, I've only gotten ask. one hate email. One? And it was this person saying, like, you obviously weren't loved enough as a child. And I was like, you're right. Yes. <laughs> That's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the book. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's literally what my book says. <laughs> my dad did not love me. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I guess I read the book. <laughs> um, so what parts of the book were cut for whatever reason that you still love and regret cutting? <laughs> Thank you for asking me this. So there is a chapter about the love of my life whose name is Fuck Taco. And the 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 book was originally the length of a book called Infinite Jest by an author called David Foster Wallace. And it was all about fuck taco. And um, I, loved, I loved every word of it. And then I gave the book to my editor and she was like, wow, you need to cut all of this. I cannot stand to read more than like 10 pages about this man, fuck taco. You look unhinged. He seems like a monster. This relationship makes no sense. So many of our editorial notes were just like, why did you keep talking to him? Why were you still dating him? Why were you, why did you do this? Why did he do this? Why, like, she was just like, this is nonsense. Um, so then I had to cut a lot of that out, but I saved all of it. <laughs> so that one day I'll get to really speak my truth. One day. <laughs> It'll end up somewhere, right? Pardon? It'll end up somewhere. It'll right? end up somewhere. I just I keep her editorial notes to keep me from not contacting him because she's just like, this is the most bizarre relationship I've ever read. You just needed an editor to intervene <laughs> <laughs> and say this makes no narrative sense. You do not come off well. He is a very bad man. <laughs> I've only emailed him once since the book came out, which was well. He, needs, he said he hasn't read the book yet, which I thought mm. was pretty par for the course. <laughs> I wish that we could have like editors intervene throughout our 20s I know. to just be like, this relationship <laughs> makes no narrative sense. <laughs> um, so you are a writing teacher and editor. Thank you. What teaching <laughs> and editing advice did you yourself refuse to heed while writing this book? I used way too many adverbs. Um, adverbs are not allowed in anything you're writing. All my students know that. But when I use them, it's fine. But you shouldn't. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Um, I also really let the inner critic dominate my writing process. So I let myself say to myself, you're a total piece of shit. Who cares what you have to say? You can't write. You shouldn't live you know so on and so forth the greatest hits um and I let that get in my way for so long and um I think like only at the very end of the writing process did I realize that like the voice in your head should be the voice of a fan who's like I love what you're doing keep doing it um like write even harder I'm so excited about this idea you're not a genius but just like a supportive person instead of someone who's just like seriously don't write another word you're embarrassing yourself apply to law school try to get married try to get someone to pay your bills for you um and so I'm glad I I figured out that fan get that fan in there um I also used I used too many semicolons. I've, I'm haunted by how many semicolons I used. That's it. The rest of the book's perfect. <laughs> and I did a great job. 
<laughs> you did. You did do a great job. Thank you. you did. <laughs> Although, according to Goodreads, the last one eighth of my book what? is too repetitive. Why are you on there? Because sometimes not allowed. you can't. Sometimes you can't help yourself. You are not allowed. <laughs> That's another thing that my students shouldn't do and I shouldn't do is check your Never reviews do it. on Goodreads. It, w- it was Alyssa's job to check my reviews for me and vet. Yes, but it didn't you only work. the good ones. But it didn't work because I then, I, I just had to know the truth. Once so you, I, I know. <laughs> you need the whole picture. You yeah. need to know what everyone's saying. We can't help ourselves, yeah. So many people are like, why is this a memoir? It's really more like essays. And I'm like, th- and then they're like, zero stars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> So who, who would play you in the movie adaptation of Hysterical? Okay, I have two answers that are equally good. One is The Mother and How I Met Your Mother. Who knows her name? Thank you. Yes, yes, we talked about this. She, she's a dead ringer. And the other one is Timothée Chalamet. <laughs> <laughs> He would be incredible. (laughs) I learned that's how you say his name. How did you learn this? Was there like a YouTube instructional? Someone corrected me Uh because I was saying Timothy Chalamet. And and Caitlin Kunkel, you can call her and ask her. She was like, it's Timothee. (laughs) Okay. Can anyone confirm? Timothee? Yes. <laughs> All right. Timote. I think it's I think it's better. It's so much better. I like it. I also like him as a choice. I think it's a good that's I a good know, one. He yes. would be so good. It's a good one. <laughs> um okay, so you nickname one of your exes Fuck Taco yeah. in the book. Um and you once bequeathed a paramour of mine. Candle butt boy <laughs> for reasons that we will not discuss. He put right a now. candle on her butt. No, he did not. He, he wanted, wanted to put to. a candle and in he, her butt. And moving <laughs> along. <laughs> he wanted to put a candle in her butt and light it and let it go all the way down. Yes. Well, <laughs> thank you for <laughs> explicating that. <laughs> Anyways, um, I was wondering if anyone in the audience wanted to tell Alyssa about an ex of theirs or it could be a current partner <laughs> so that they could get an um, unforgettable nickname for them i'm so good at this this is it's like gonna be my really good trick. this is a priceless opportunity <laughs> right now okay. yes His new name is Tampon Popsicle. (laughs) If you think about it, it's so gross. (laughs) Why? Why? Oh, my God. Anyone else? (laughs) I really want to call someone Mitch McConnell's neck. Save that one. (laughs) Yes. Oh, it's a girl? No nickname. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> she she went through a lot to ha- I I can't <laughs> It was complex what she was doing and I forgive her for you. <laughs> Any more? No. no. Okay. Um <clears throat> so Cheryl Strayed once told you famously, write like a motherfucker. What's your advice to aspiring writers who think they can't write? So that was great advice in a way, but for for someone like me with a lot of mental illness, it was a re- it was really debilitating. I was like, I can't do that. I I can't even like write much less like a motherfucker. So my anthem became write like an idiot. To just like completely lower the stakes 
just like make it so that it wasn't a holy experience. It wasn't something that was going to make or break me. I didn't have to prove myself to anybody. I didn't have to be good. I just had to have fun. And I think idiots have more fun than aspiring motherfuckers. End of advice. Thank you. I like that. <laughs> the sort of bliss of, of idiocy, right? Like in the writing Yeah, process. it's just yeah. like, well, once you don't have any of that pressure and you're not trying to sell a book to make rent or f- make the world fall in love with you or prove yourself as an artiste, then it's just, it's, it can just be an experiment and something that you can just like fuck around with and the more I embrace looking like an idiot, the just the freer I become. Yes. Good life advice yeah. in general. Yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Last question. It took you only 11 years to write this book. What can we expect from you in 2033? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> hysterical 2, which is um, the full text of our G chats. <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps it's Hysterical 2, fuck taco. Fuck taco. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I like it. Uh, yeah, I'm going to get to work immediately. In a few years. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to take a while to compile all those, all those G-chats. Yeah. There's a novel in there. Yes. Yes. So, Thank you. Um, <laughs> does anyone have any questions for Alyssa? Yeah, if you do, raise your hand. I'll come over to you with the mic. Um, love your work. Number one fan. <laughs> Thank you, total stranger. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm really curious ab- about your experience, like reading what people had to say about Cheryl Strayed's response to you and whether that felt debilitating. I feel like because her response was so kind in the Dear Sugar book, um, it almost like left space for other people to be like super assholes. And I'm also really curious um, about whether publishing um, the piece about the author the famous author whose names none of us have any idea of. Yeah, and um, he's not in the audience tonight, I checked. Yes. And how writing that piece and hearing, like, the, the it was really in, like, the wake of Me Too, that the response to that, did that change how you wrote this book? Oh, I'll do this second question first, I guess, because it's harder. So I wrote that, I wrote about that experience, like, forever ago. And it wasn't even a part of my book proposal. I, you know, because I had been so effectively silenced and it just wasn't worth it. And I had been talked out of it so many times. And when Me Too was happening, that was like smack in the middle of my sickness, which was no coincidence. And um, I, I remember just feeling like, oh, now, now everyone wants to hear our stories. Like, no one ever wanted to hear our stories before. And just, like, feeling, like, mad about that. And it's like, oh, we're now given this time frame. And it's like, you must confess now. Um, And it's like, your responsibility as a woman. Um, And I, I didn't, I did not like that. Uh, And I still wasn't going to talk about it. Because I was like, it's just so much easier on everybody if I don't. Except for me. I wasn't included in everyone. Um, and and then as I was writing, about, like, I just couldn't write the book without it. It just kept, like, chasing me down. It just, like, wouldn't leave me alone. And then as I was writing about it, I was just like, I love writing about it. Like, I was just like, I, I just, oh, I just, like, I, I just loved how um, I could finally say wasn't I, what I wasn't supposed to say and I can talk about how all these people didn't want me to talk about what I was talking about. And at the time I was, and the whole time I was telling myself like, no one will care. Um, But especially because like, I'm not trying to name him. Like I'm not trying to like make it a, a gossip story. I'm not trying to make it salacious. I'm not trying to make it so that it trends or anything like that. Like that, that wasn't the point. I wanted everyone to feel like, the editor was their boss, was someone they knew. I like intentionally wanted the vagueness to like hit everybody where it's like this could just be 
someone else. And like the ordinariness of it had always talked me out of writing about it because I'm like, this isn't a good story. This isn't compelling. This isn't that big of a deal. But that to me ended up being so interesting because I was like, oh, we just dismiss these everyday attacks that we will not call abuse and we and it is and we must and we like must talk about the everyday bullshit and like collect the receipts and print them and publish them to great acclaim um because that's the only way anything will ever change I don't know what your question was um but so so and then and I think like the power of the me too movement and like the positive stuff that did come out of it made me feel comfortable, confident, and excited to contribute. And I'm not sure I would have if the Me Too movement didn't happen. I don't know. Um, and then there's other stuff that I shouldn't say. OK. Then the Cheryl Strayed question. I mean, the the thing about that, there weren't any haters. I mean, actually, there's like a website called I Hate Cheryl Strayed and Elizabeth says too. <laughs> that I found. <laughs> And that hurt. <laughs> um, but it was mostly people were being so supportive, and that's what was so annoying, because I was like, I can't do it. <laughs> like, I don't. They were like, we're rooting for you. And I'm like, please don't. <laughs> please. I I'm em I was embarrassed by that letter, like, this, like 10 minutes after it hit the internet. Um, and I, it's like, it's weird to be known for a public suicide note like that, especially with when you know what happens later, which is devastating. Um, so all those fucking supportive people were such jackasses. <laughs> I wish there were more haters. I feel like I'm more fueled, fueled by them now. Anything else? <laughs> Next question. What are your stupid questions? So I had never read you. Was the sorry? Are we allowed to take the? I had never read you. It was my first time reading you. And well, I find you, you hilarious. So funny. But what I most uh, uh, call to or attracted to in your writing is how the, what the truth behind your, you being hilarious is and how relatable it is and how painful that relating to that feel mm. and how liberating um, it must have felt for you, like just the, the joy that I feel reading you coming out of all that hiding and the silence um i don't know where i'm going with my question initially it was it's okay compliments <laughs> are fine yeah but, but <laughs> what i what i want oh um the entire time i'm wondering when you write to yourself the things that you'll never publish are you always funny oh yes always uh without a doubt <laughs> i think if i'm really being funny that's like a sign to me that i do want to publish it because it like just I'm like this is now entertainment and that to me is something more than like a diary entry because you have to figure out when you're writing nonfiction how do I make this like when you say to yourself like no one's gonna care the next thing you have to say to yourself is how well how am I gonna make them care and that's for me that's like by being funny by being informative by being vulnerable by being empathetic um, so when I like hit on something funny, then I'm like, this is good. And, and I feel like, like my darkest, my, um, like the darkest humor, the stuff that I shouldn't share, that's the stuff I like want to share the most. And I like feel the most excited about. And like, there was a time, like when I first was started working on the book in 2010, I was like, I'm going to write so well that no one can deny me that um, everyone will like my book. Like, I'm going to be that good of a writer. And wow, <laughs> the confidence uh, that I had of, you know, a man's confidence. Um, and then I realized that, like, you don't want that. Like, you want people to have, like, a strong response to your writing and to, like, f feel, like, repulsed by it. Because that really means, like, you're you're saying something that's like triggering something inside of them that they don't like, like their monstrosity, like something that they, how they hurt another person. Um, and you're just, you're not going to please everyone. And I think um, it feels really good to like 
please like a just like a certain subset like all the people in this room as opposed to like the world that feels so much more meaningful than just like blanket praise this is me justifying not being on the bestseller list (laughs) (laughs) fuck the masses Yes, and I and I now I was uh, like everyone was so ashamed of my secrets, and I like they were just they kept me up every night, and I was like, are these gonna keep me up every night for the rest of my fucking life until I'm dead? And then I became like interested in my secrets, and I'm like, wow, like why did I do that? Why did I tell that insane lie? Why um, why was I so ashamed of like X, Y, and Z? And I just find so much humanity in that. Like, I'm like, I lied because I was so scared because like women are punished for if for saying something that isn't nice. Like, that's the only thing we can say and nothing else. So I'm like, well, I did all of this stuff for a reason, for survival, because because in our culture, we have to do extreme things to avoid retribution and we're held to such a high standard to be liked and to be loved and we must be perfect and we must have no secrets and we must never lie and it's just like it's exhausting and um I just I could like find humanity in being bad like for myself and for other people and I know like when other people when I read about how bad they've been I feel so much better because I'm just like, oh my God, me too. I do that fucked up thing too. I just love talking about all the fucked up shit we do. And I just wish we talked about it more. Like I want to talk about like my mustache and um, that I plucked before I came here and I meant to text (laughs) you about it, but I didn't have any time. Um, And I couldn't like, my pants were undone the entire way here because I ate too much soup (laughs) and I couldn't get them on. It's just like, and and I feel like those moments are funny and it's like, why the fuck? did I care so long and hold it in for so long and it just I you just don't have to be that unhappy it's just it's it's a fiction that those that these things are secrets and they're fucked up and we're fucked up like yeah it's fucking patriarchy fuck <laughs> hi hi I'm curious about if you always wrote like going back when you were a little girl and then how you got your writing out there in the first place. Like, did you publish an essay somewhere, or was the um, the San Francisco literary scene where you were able to get your writing more widely oh, known? Oh, I didn't really write in San Francisco. I worked for writers, because they, they didn't want me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I remember like being in elementary school and writing stories and like laminating the covers, like being like an illustrator, and I was always, um, writing stories about my mom's marriages and divorces and putting them up on classroom walls. I just thought it was, I was like, this drama is compelling. I was like in kindergarten. (laughs) Uh, I just always felt that, felt that need. And I wrote like a book report in third grade about a toilet. And it was, there was like, it was like a book like going potty. Um, (laughs) it, It was like, it was something like that. And I wrote a book report on it, and it was on the overhead projector. And I was just like, I'm a star. <laughs> I just, and I was like, got to get on that overhead projector of life. Uh, I always wanted it, but I never knew. Well, I mean, writing was never a career. I was going to be a lawyer because I could write. And that, that's, I was pre-law until I was getting a D in logic, and I had to withdraw, and I wasn't. I couldn't hack it. And But we didn't have a creative writing major, so I did English literature, and I was told I was bad at analytical writing, and so many people love to tell you how you're bad at things. Um, But I just couldn't quit, and I tried to write a book, and I got so depressed that, I tried to write a novel, I should say. I just had to try and fail so much, and I did that, and I wrote a lot on the internet for free, and figured out my voice and what I wanted to write about. It took me forever to figure out what I wanted to write and what form I wanted to write in. I feel like MFA school should be as long as med school because it really takes that long to figure out what it is you want to say, how you want to say it, and how to say it well. 
Um, so I just tried and failed forever. I just couldn't fuck. I like quit thousands of times, but then I couldn't stay away. And then my parents paid my rent. <laughs> so it was, that made it easier. <laughs> I would not, I don't think I would have done it otherwise. Bonus. <laughs> Oh, hi, NATO. Hi. Uh, I, I have a question about craft. Yeah. You're you're funny on the page and you're funny in the room. Thank you. How do you... You're welcome. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is all you should say. <laughs> good night, everybody. Uh, how, how do you think about writing funny in uh, in the, the difference between writing funny on the page and writing, being funny in the room? You know, I got to say that I... I think being funny on the page is working really hard to to bring the room energy onto the page, like closing that gap between being funny out loud and being funny in writing. And I try to just like capture how I speak and think and interact and play on the page. And I have to trick myself in a lot of ways. So a lot of my writing starts in emails or text messages some something where like i'm trying to like impress someone like my best writing was to fuck taco because i was trying to make him fall in love with me so i was just like incredible with the prose <laughs> and the jokes like because i was like just like working so fucking hard for it um so that's that's what i do and i um I take a lot of notes. I watch so much television and I just figure out what makes me laugh and then I try to emulate it. And I did it uh, per perfectly every time. <laughs> Although, I, so I was on The View, thank you. And um, <laughs> everyone, of course, on YouTube hates me. And this one man was like, why is she a comedian? She's not funny at all. And then this uh, the other commenter was so amazing. She was like, she's not a comedian. She teaches humor writing. It's different. And she teaches other people to be funny. And I was like, that's true. I do do that. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you just have like good taste. But uh, I think many people would say the opposite of what you said. <laughs> um, hi. Hi. Uh, my question is, do you keep a journal or a diary? And if so, how do you translate it into your essays or memoir? No, I can't do it. I feel very stressed. It makes me in touch with my mortality because I'm like, I don't want anybody to find this when I'm dead. <laughs> and so I can't muddy the pages with embarrassing things because all I can do is think about death. It's just, it's a straight shot from try, trying to write in a journal to I'm going to die and this is going to be what's left behind. Um, so I can't do it. I can, only, I can only write emails and text messages, which is like my form of working stuff out. And Gchat. Many of our G-chats appear in her memoir, Want Me, yeah. A Sex Writer's Journey into the Heart of Desire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wish I journaled. I can't do it. <laughs> oh, another perfect stranger. Hi, Alyssa. <laughs> um, it's good to see you. Hi, Tracy. <laughs> um, to bounce off what NATO said, you are funny on the page and funny aloud. And I think that's why I loved the audiobook so much. So not to be a marketing plug, which I'm not. No one has paid me to say this. But <laughs> I bought the book and the audiobook. And I so thoroughly enjoyed the audiobook because you were having so much fun. I did. And <laughs> I want you to, if you wouldn't mind describing what that process was like to read your entire book, like from title and dedication to the bitter end like y it was clear you're having fun so can you just describe what that was like yeah there was like a part of me that really wanted to rehearse because I was like this is my moment to act and I'm I've just always wanted to act um and Joan Didion also we have that in common she also wanted to be an actor because she's like writing and acting is the same impulse it's performance it's make-believe but writers have to do it alone um, so I wanted to rehearse it, but it's a million trillion words, so I couldn't. So I just like went in cold and you go in for like five days, like for like six, eight hour, sometimes four hour sessions. And you're in the teeny tiniest of rooms and you have this little tiny baby screen. It's not even a full screen of your book and you're just flipping through it and it's just you and one other person. And, um, 
it's excruciating. I mean, it's like a physically brutal process, right? You recorded your own audio book for Want Me, A Sex Writer's Journey Into the Heart of Desire. Uh, (laughs) It's really hard. And um, I had to take quite a few emotional breaks because it was like, I cannot believe I am saying this shit out loud. It was hard enough to write at the beginning when I was just like alone. But then I was just like, fuck it. I just like was... Like, I was like, I just want to do this on one take. Um, <laughs> and I just embraced everything I've always wanted to be, and I feel who I truly am. <laughs> uh, I'm an only child, and I've just always been able to entertain myself in front of a mirror. So I just, like, channeled that <laughs> skill, and um, I just had so much fun, and I tried to not be in my head about it, because, like, to me, I was like, oh, I fucked up. I could have done that better. I could have gone back, like, let's do it again. And um, I just kind of, like, powered through. And um, it was just so fun. Like, I got to re-perform the vagina monologues a little bit, do some moaning. (laughs) And then, then, like, the producer, she was like, just be, like, silly at the end with the credits. And I was looped out. And it's just, it's a very fun thing to be able to perform your life's work. (laughs) And to see my sentences are way too fucking long and I'm never going to write a long sentence again. (laughs) It's so hard. It was so hard to say it. And I was like, I'm never going to use hard words or anyone else's name. I learned so many writing lessons from having to read the audio book where I'm like, I only want to write something that's easy to say out loud. Denouement. <laughs> yeah, for me it was like realizing how many words I'd been mispronouncing my entire oh, life. Oh, right. <laughs> Cor- like Timote. Corporeal. Or oh. Cor- 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 An- corporeal. Analgesic. <laughs> corporeal. Uh, Adrian Rich. Oh, is it Adrian? I, I, think, I think that's what it ended up being. Yeah, the, the sound guy was like, no, you're saying that Moira wrong. Moira Dungan. No. We're just going down the list. <laughs> We'll be here all night. <laughs> Camille Palia. Oh. oh. <laughs> okay, cool. Bye. <laughs> uh, any, uh, any other questions before we uh, set up a signing line? Compliments are also fine. Compliments also <laughs> accepted. Quick question. Thank you. How do you think in chapters as you go through your book and relate it to your life? Oh, Blarf. Um, (laughs) I don't know. I think I just had, like, stories. I had certain scenes and ideas that I wanted to convey, and, like, the organization process was so intense and always changing. And if I had any advice for someone writing a book, it's just, like, like, know it's going to be over edited and you're it's not over edited but it's going to be edited a lot and you're going to be rewriting it a lot and so don't be so like I have to get everything perfect because things need to and must move around so much so like the organization was a big thing that I was moving around and because it was like first it was like organized thematically then it was like chronologically then it was whatever it was. Um, and I think just like the chapter titles helped me get, get myself in order. Um, and to this day, there's a battle raging on Goodreads about whether or not I pulled it off. A lot of people just really believe that it's a memoir and essays, linked essays, um, a nonfiction novel. Um, and it's just so funny to me because it's like, when I started writing the book, I was told that you can't publish funny personal essays. So I was like, okay, I'll write a memoir. Then I was too young to write a memoir, they said. (laughs) Then they told me to write narrative nonfiction. So I did. Then they're like, well, you don't have a dick, so you can't do that. Um, Then I ended up with what I ended up with, and everybody should be fucking happy about it. (laughs) (laughs) I wrote a book. (laughs) That's all that matters. (laughs) Y'all keep it going for Alyssa Bassist. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you to Tracy Clark Flory for being here tonight and, you, uh, and leading the conversation. Thank you, Tracy. Um, Thank you. Make some noise, you guys. <laughs> yes. Um, so, Alyssa, you're down to sign some books? Yes. Yes. So, thanks to all of you who've already purchased a copy, uh, if you still need one, um, or you are um, appropriately thinking about the forthcoming holidays and would like to gift some books to your friends. Uh, we do have more at the register straight back. Um, and um, if you would be so kind as to let Alyssa um, a walk through past you, I know that you're going to want to embrace her and shower her with love, but mm. please wait until you're in the signing line. Uh, Alyssa, the table is uh, just here to the right uh, past Julianne. Um, and then, yeah, I think um, that's probably all I need to tell you other than that uh, Tracy's book is at the register too. You should, you should go home with at least two books tonight. And um, I just want to thank you all for being here and make some make some more noise for Lisa and thank Tracy. Thank you guys thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>